ABC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. Good morning, St. John family, and welcome to this week's edition of SJC News. Take note of all of the events happening with our ministries and be sure to do your part. Remember, every joint supplieth. Tomorrow, May 31st is Memorial Day. It's an American holiday dedicated to remembering, honoring, and celebrating the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. Please take a moment with us on tomorrow to remember their faces, honor their sacrifices, and salute their lives. May their souls rest in peace. Let's all celebrate. Our students have completed the school year. Congratulations to all of our students from pre-K to graduate school. We celebrate you and we will honor you during the month of June. To all parents in preparation for our honors and recognition event, please email all of the honors and awards that your students received this school year to Messiah Williams at St. John AME membership at gmail.com. Please stop by the church today between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. to pick up your communion kit in preparation for our virtual communion service on Sunday, June 6th. Stay tuned this week for the Zoom link and communion service details. Congratulations, Pastor Washington, for being selected to give the Father's Day sermon on WOKS 1340 a.m and 94.1 FM on Sunday, June 30th at 10 a.m. St. John, set your reminders and alarms now as you don't want to miss it. Join Pastor Washington every Monday and Friday at 7 a.m. for prayer and devotion. Prayer isn't just about asking God for things you need or desire. It's about establishing a relationship with Him built on faith and trust in Him. God knows the desires of your heart long before you even think to ask, but he still loves to hear from you, whether you're asking for guidance or giving thanks, because it draws you closer to him. St. John, draw nearer. God is the owner of everything. We are the stewards who have been charged with managing everything he has placed in our care. Support St. John with your stewardship guard and manage what has been entrusted to you for if we do this voluntarily we have a reward this concludes today's edition of sjc news be informed stay connected and spread the news now here's donya albright today is the day that the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning and welcome to St. John's Virtual Worship Experience. I am Pastor Richard Allen Washington, Sr. and I'm grateful that you have joined us on this celebration of the Lord's Day. We greet you in the love and in the care of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We welcome you this weekend, this holiday weekend, where you and your family or those who you love may reflect upon those who have lost their lives in the service protecting country and people, living for a cause greater than their own life. We remember them this weekend and we honor them by praying for their families who are left to cherish their memory. Please tell someone in the armed forces that you know how appreciative you are of their service and yes, how you pray for them and their well-being. Sometimes family, the toughest part of any battle that you've gone through on behalf of your country is after the battle is finished and the recovery that you must deal with. And we remember those service men and women at this time. St. John, we pride ourselves on 
caring and loving those who have served their country. Many have been a member of our congregation over the years, and we certainly know how important you are. And St. John, on behalf of the St. John Church, here next to Fort Benning, we say thank you and we remember you. Let me invite you back to the place of scripture where we were last week. We continue, hopefully, in the concluding sermon this day about what God has given us in the Old Testament through the prophet Ezekiel chapter 37, verses one through 14. I invite you to get your device, whether it's a phone or a hard copy Bible, and prepare to join us in the reading of the word. Today, I invite you back to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses one through 14. Hear God's word on this morning. We welcome you to join us. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and the Lord brought me out by the Spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones, and God led me around them. And behold, there were many upon the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And God said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Again, God said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will cause tendons to come upon you and I will cause flesh to cover your skin or to provide skin. And I will put breath in you and you will live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse seven, so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a great noise and behold a rattling and the bones came together, bone, to its bone. And as I looked, there were tendons on them, and the flesh had come on them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four corners of the wind, O oh, breathe, O oh, breathe upon the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as God commanded and breath came to them and they lived and stood on their feet and exceedingly was a great host. And God said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones have been dried up and we have lost hope. We are clean cut off from God. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and I will raise you from your graves. O my people, I will bring you home into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from the graves, O oh my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done it, says the Lord. Amen. Our subject comes back to where we were last week Valley Living, Part 2, How to Survive in the Valley. Valley Living, Part 2, How to Survive in the Valley. On last week, as a quick recap, we know that God picked the prophet Ezekiel up from his own life and took him to, in a vision, took him to a valley. We understood that that valley was full of bones and we understand that God showed him a 360 degree view of the bones. And we understand that the the interesting thing about that whole experience was God had the audacity 
to ask Ezekiel, can these bones live? We know that Ezekiel was wise enough to say, God, thou knowest, which means only you can tell whether these bones will live. We understand that Ezekiel placed the emphasis of changing the circumstances on God. And so we heard last week, you remember, about how Ezekiel was commanded by God to preach a sermon that he never preached before. And that sermon was simply prepare to hear the word of God. We understood last week how important the word of God is in our life and in the people of God's life, the Israelites. But do we know, do you remember how the Israelites got in the predicament they were in? Family, just as a quick recap, the Israelites got into this valley that drove them to a place where they had dry bones, where there was no marrow or blood left in them. And as the scripture said, it was a very dry. They got into this position because they were in captivity. And I want to remind you that being captive was a choice of their own. God loved them, gave them the best of God's green earth. God had blessed them, brought them through all of the dangers seen and unseen. God had given them every gift that they could ask for, taken them through over mountains and valleys. And yet they decided to live, remember this, by their flesh and not by their faith. And God shared with them through prophetic witnesses over the years that there was going to be a time when they would find themselves in captivity. In essence, find themselves in chains. Further, find themselves in bondage to circumstances that their flesh led them into. And if I would, again, place a kickstand down just for you, a divine one, to share with you that remember this family, if you remember nothing else from this short series, many of the chains and the bonds that we have found ourselves tied to now, we are in them because we allowed our flesh to dictate how we would live as opposed to trusting in our faith. Whenever we have been victims of flesh living, our flesh has a tendency to get us tied up into circumstances, relationships, or careers, mind you, that God never intended. And watch this, we live below the life that God wants us to live. The children of Israel were that way in this valley. They had excluded God, ignored God, turned their back on God. And for that, the Babylonian people had overcome them, overwhelmed them, taken advantage of them, family, and placed them in bondage, and they were stuck. Can I ask a question? How many times have your choices of the flesh and my choices of the flesh led us both, led us as a family into circumstances where we were bound and chained by decisions that we should not have been? Some of us have gotten into relationships with people and are struggling to get loose from them. And let me say that I'm not suggesting that every relationship you get in leads to bondage, no. But there are those of us who are here today, who are listening today, that can testify if I had to do it all over again. I may not have gotten tied up with him. I may not have gotten caught up with her. And I could, I, I could have avoided wasting, get this family, five or seven years of my life if I had not got tied up with them. So I, I want to encourage you to check your relationships, to make sure that your flesh did not lead you, but your faith brought you through. Don't be like the children of Israel today. Don't be like them. Don't get into circumstances where everything you have, it takes and it dries you up and you're in bondage waiting for God to come get you. And certainly beloved, the children of Israel, when they looked around and saw that they were desolate and dead. They began to say God doesn't love us because what they had as images of God were no longer present. Man, it was bad for them. And the truth be told, some of us are having those kind of experiences right now. It's bad for us. And we don't know how we're gonna live now that we are in a valley experience. Well, I've got good news. Last week we were introduced to the fact that we just need the word that the beginning of our restoration, the beginning of our reform, the beginning of our restart, our refocus, doesn't begin with new job, doesn't begin with new man or new woman, doesn't begin with new city, doesn't begin, watch this, with a new degree. 
It doesn't begin with a new opportunity for a new company. Your beginning, your fresh beginning, your restart, your refocus begins when you place God's word at the center and front of your life. Can I go old school on you? It reminds me of the AME church and the Methodist church's doctrine that says on any given Sunday used to be, it used to say, you shall have no other gods before me and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your what? Soul, with all of your mind. It, 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 it reminds reminds me of hearing the preacher and the congregation say together, this is the first and great commitment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And all of a sudden, at the close of that experience, the praise of God will go up in the form of a glory of Patrick. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. God requires us to place him first. That's why in every circumstance or church you enter, it is the word of God that's at the center of that particular building. I, I'm going to come back and get ready to go a little further today and prayerfully close it out. I'm already in the middle of it, if you pay attention. So first, we learned last week the importance of the Word of God in our restart. We understand now that if the God's Word is not first, our restart, our refocus, our redevelopment, our new beginning cannot take place. We will remain dead. I don't care where you are and what you're attempting to do. Hear me this morning. It is important to place God's word at the forefront of your life. The word of God in scripture tells us the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I've come to announce to you, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are in, the word can, can be the beginning of your fresh start. So what does happen next? We learned last week, as the old preacher would say, the foot bone was connected by the toe bone. The toe bone connected to the foot bone. The foot bone connected to the ankle bone. The ankle bone connected to the what? Shin bone. The shin bone connected to the what? Leg bone. The leg bone connects to the knee bone. The knee bone connects to the what? Do you hear me? It connects to the leg bone. Then the leg bone connects to the what? thigh bone, the thigh bone connects to the hip bone, the hip bone connects to the backbone, the backbone connects all of that. We, we remember hearing that as children and over the years, beloved, and then God manifest flesh. Hear me today. All of this took place off of Ezekiel speaking the word of God. I want you to know that your beginning does happen when you put the word first. God can construct what the world has destructed. Ooh, I'm about to shout. God can construct what our life has failed to get in order. God's word can construct where you and I have been messing around and making decisions that have not been productive or successful. God's word can help us order our steps in his word and the difference can be made. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but just allow the word to guide you. Allow the word to love you. Allow the word to get down within you and the word can make the difference plain text says today that after Ezekiel hear and preaches the word and says hear the word and the bones take shape get this family and flesh manifest itself what comes next is extraordinary now I want to pause and invite you to, to engage in a little bit of what I enjoy the Marvel Universe that's right DC and Marvel but I really love the Marvel Universe the Marvel Universe has a character by the name of Dr. Stephen Strange and Dr. Strange is one of my favorite characters in the Marvel Universe Dr. Strange has the ability family to use his mind and get this his spirit to do things that seem impossible. Dr. Strange is that character that believes like I do, that there is always something behind what you see. There's a world active and, and operating behind the world that we are experiencing now. If you have never seen Dr. Strange, the movie, you should check it out or read the comics. He's a, quite a fascinating man. The text in today's word reminds me that if Ezekiel was a Marvel comic personality, he would be, it would be Dr. Ezekiel, and it would be amazing. God says the word has been preached and now they are formed family. And there is a body with bones and flesh on it, but the body is still dead. What do you do, family, when you are placing God's word first and your life begins to come back together, you can see it happening, but there is no difference yet. You can see your finances getting straight, but it's not completely that your credit is in order. 
You can see relationships start to turn around and redirect the energies that you've been giving them and they've been giving you. You can see the job starting to shift and some differences are made with who you work with. But yet the end is not there. And yet nothing has changed. It just looks a little different. Come closer to the text. Ezekiel sees the body is there, but it's still dead. You can have the look of something alive and still be dead. You can have the look of a healthy marriage, a healthy family, and it's still dead. You can have the look of a marvelous job and a marvelous working environment, but it still is dead. Just because something looks alive does not mean it's alive. There are many things in this world and culture that look to be alive, but are dead. Can I bring it a little closer? There are many churches that have people in them that we can think by passing by the building that it's alive. There are many persons listening today that know that there are ministries, congregations that appear to be alive on the outside, but when you get to know them, you know they're very dead. As a matter of fact, I think one of the greatest tragedies in the Christian faith, in the Muslim faith, or I should say the Islamic faith, in a Hindu faith journey, is the look of something, but it's not so. This is the greatest imposter circumstance we can ever experience. For someone or some group to look like they are alive, but they're dead. This is what Ezekiel experiences this week. He sees the bones come to form. He sees flesh manifest itself on them. But Ezekiel does not see any movement. And the body is just a corpse, dead. Come closer. What do you do when you've worked hard as you know, you've placed God first, you've chosen God's word to head your life, but yet the circumstance still is dead? How do you survive in the valley when everything looks a certain way, but you know it's not yet active? There's a word. When Ezekiel preaches the word of God, then God says to Ezekiel, now I need you to call forth, watch this and I'm done, the wind and watch what happens. Here is the exciting part. Remember this word from last week, the ruah of God, the breath of God. The Hebrew word for breath is ruah. And so God says to Ezekiel, you've got to now that you've preached and told the bones to, to, to hear the word and you've preached the word, now I want to take it a step further and experience with you, Ezekiel, something you've never seen. Now let me pause and invite you to the humor side of God. Once you and I choose to trust God by doing the unusual, then God will make us do the impossible. Ezekiel has already preached that's unusual to a, a valley of dry bones and they started to move. Now God says, now that you'll preach to dry bones, now preach to what is not present until it becomes present. You missed it. There are times in our life where our faith must speak that which is not until it comes into place. In essence, the benefit of faith is to say and see what is not present until what is not present becomes your reality. That's why people have to understand the word of God says the power of life and death lives in our mouth, the tongue. And I want to share, share a word with you today. Be careful what you place your mouth on. Be careful, get your mind out of the gutter, where you place your mouth you got to be careful how you use the mouth and the words that God formulates in you. You've got to be careful. You have the power to make somebody's day live or to have them have a sense of deadness. You have the power to speak life to your children and your family every time you open your mouth or you can speak death. I want to serve notice. I have sat with enough adults in life as a pastor and a caregiver and a, con and a confidant and a counselor. I've sat with enough adults who have been damaged. There's a song out by her. You could do damage 
Damn it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, inside joke. They, 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 they have sat with enough of them as they told their whole story. I've sat with enough of adults to know that the words of their parents years ago have damaged them to the point where even as adults, they have yet to break free from that curse, from that downing, from that, from that unfortunate experience of hearing their parents say unfortunate things about them, whether it was comparing them to someone else, whether it was telling them they could do better, whether it was telling them they were displeased and not satisfied. I've seen enough. Be careful how you use your words. God says, Ezekiel, use your words to speak to the wind until the wind gives birth to what will give life to the bones. You missed your shout. That God gave each one of us the ability to speak ruah, breath, into situations that look like they are alive, but they are dead. You can speak life into your relationships. You can speak life into your own existence. You can tell self, listen, I may not be where I want to be, but I'm grateful because God is not finished with me yet. That's the power of the black church. That's the power of those who are brought in chains over here. They spoke their freedom into existence. They spoke the difference into it. Listen, Listen, if our four parents, black and white, had not spoken against slavery and its, demoni its demonized activity, we would still be in it. They had the power to speak against the death and to speak life. I've come to tell you, God tells Ezekiel, you speak to the wind until breath comes. There comes a moment where we have got to speak to dead situations until life, according to God, comes to them. Now, I ain't saying stay in nothing that's completely dead. No, no, no. Ezekiel is in the midst of dry bones, but he hears God. God instructs Ezekiel, not his emotion. God speaks to Ezekiel, not his own mind. God speaks to Ezekiel. You've got to know that God must speak and not you and your flesh. Okay? Text says, Ezekiel began to call to the winds from the four corners. This is Dr. Strange like calling on things to change the reality of what is presented. You just don't know. This is what I really want you to get now. You have the power to change your reality based on how you use your words. You've got the power, according to God, to speak in such a way that life changes because of how you would not. Listen, I want to pause and make this live for you. When I was in seminary working toward a master of divinity, we had a guest lecturer for the semester named Dr. David Shannon. He was the former president of Virginia Union University. Hey, hey, V-U-U. He, he was the former president. Dr. David Shannon was an extraordinary man, one of the most brilliant men I've ever had an opportunity to, to engage with in conversation. Dr. Shannon told us that he refused to accept negative anything. Everything that he did and talked about was positive. He could take any negative situation and push the positive buttons in it. And there were people in the classroom that did not believe him. And he would challenge them week after week to bring every negative dead circumstance before him. And he would speak life in such a way, family, that they believed that there was going to be a difference. I saw it with my own eyes. A young man stood flat footed and yelled to the top of his voice to combat about death and dying and disease. And Dr. Shannon stood flat footed and combated every one of them. And before the semester was over, the young man had come to believe that the disease and the death that was happening in his world was not the end, watch this, but the very beginning. Dr. Shannon fascinated me. And I asked him, how is it that you believe that there is nothing that negativity cannot be overcome with good? What, what brings it on in your life? 
He says, I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunder roll. I've watched God break things and build them back. God can do anything, son, as long as you speak that way. Come closer. Ezekiel speaks until the wind comes and gives life. And watch this, as the wind gives life to the corpse, the corpse then stands up. You missed your shout moment. A part of why we aren't able to stand any up, stand up anymore is because we have yet to speak the right language to the corpses that are laying dead. To the young black men in the world, you know I'm coming. For the young brothers who are out there who appear to be dead, dejected, demented, and nothing but walking dead, the church has to speak the right language in order to make those brothers understand that they are more than the system has said they would be. For the sisters, you too, but specifically for the brother who has given up on himself and the family who has given up on him and the ones who said, I'm tired and I'm sick of what you're doing. Speak words of life in the right language and watch how it makes a difference. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to become what you want them to become overnight or even over the years. But you've got to be that place where the Ruah of God enters into them and they will stand firm one day. I close today. I got to get out of here. A holiday weekend has come. Y'all don't want to hear me. You want to get on that grill and I do too. So I'm going to let you go. I bid you good afternoon. Have a good week. Enjoy the day off. I hope you are blessed. And yes, I'll see you next week when we dine together on the Lord's Supper. Tune in next week for the virtual communion experience. But I want to close with this. There was a man who had an experience on the battlefield during the close of the Civil War. Listen to me. At the close of the Civil War, there was a young man, 20 years of age, newly appointed captain, was injured by a cannon fire. His shoulder was broken and his chest was opened by the remnants of the cannon's shot that ripped through his body. He fell immediately to the ground. And at that point, with his chest open, he looked as if he were dead. And the medic came, and as the medic looked at him, he said, there is absolutely nothing we can do for you. We pray your soul, trust God. And the medic passed him by for other patients. The canopy, the stretcher driver came by, or carrier, came by, looked at him and said, there's nothing we can do. We've got to use these cots for people who have a chance to live. And he passed him by. At that moment, this young 20 year old captain who was injured could only lay on the battlefield and hear people yelling and screaming and being toted off for hopes in living again. Interestingly enough, this young 20 year old had gone to Yale University for education before he went into the military and fought for the Union. Before this, before he became an officer in the Union Army in the Civil War, he attended Yale. And at Yale family, guess what? He had taken some courses and they had convinced him that God was not real. So he had lost his faith in God and become an atheist. However, on this battlefield, when those battle wounds began to wear on him and nobody, nobody was assisting him, he laid on his back family and looked up as the sky turned from day to night and he missed, he looked and he saw the clouds become the stars. And at that moment, as the day shifted from day to night and no help was in sight, nothing but dead bodies laid around him, he began to wrestle yet again with this idea of God. What you don't know is that he had very devout parents who were Christians and hard workers in the church back in the home place of Massachusetts. And they prayed for him and they interceded for him. 
and they spoke words of life in him in letters to him. And even when he was not there, they prayed that he would survive. Their words were of life and not death. And family, between the day and the night coming for this young 20 year old captain, he looked at those stars and wrestled with the idea of God. And he began about the third hour of the late night, which was 3 a.m. He began, family, to call on a God whom he did not know. He called on God until the morning came. And at that time, other medics and stretcher units were coming by. And all of a sudden they looked at him and said, this man is alive, he, he's alive. They loaded him up and took him to the hospital and I come to tell you, not finished, but I've come to tell you that when he got into the hospital, he did not ask for food. He did not ask for water. He did not ask to get a pen and a piece of paper to write his parents. The man asked for the chaplain to come see him. He asked for the preacher to come see him. Go get the preacher for me. And the chaplain came and said, may I serve you? And family, in that moment, he confessed that I have been a sinner. I did not believe in God, but I do know that God kept me through the night. And I confess, I know there is a God. And I confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And I am confessing that I am a Christian from this day. I want to be baptized. Hear me. At that moment, at that very moment, he became a Christian, and as he healed, he began to read. And as he healed, he became an ordained preacher. And he began to serve as a pastor in churches in the Philadelphia area, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He grew because of his gifts and the way he told the story of the gospel. Family, let me cut across the field because I know some of y'all are bored. As he grew in his witness, he began to write books, but that was insufficient for him. He decided, I want to do more than preach and write books. He helped to found a hospital, but that was not yet enough for him. He said God had given him life to do something more than preach, do something more than start hospital, do something more than just serve in the way that he had been serving. He wanted to help others come to know that God is real. And this young man was the founder, eventually became the founder of Temple University, Russell Cornwell. Russell Herman Cornwell. Check him out. He wrote the most famous sermon in the early part of the 20th century, Acres of Diamonds. This man was converted on a deathbed and gave life till he died. That's all God wants us to do. We can be on the way to death, but God has the power by the Ruach, the breath of God to give life to us. I am not certain that you have heard God communicate clearly today because I am a human and I make plenty of mistakes and I am not all that I ought to be just yet, but the Lord is working on me. What I am clear is that I want to communicate this to you. When you want to restart your life, when you want to begin again, first and foremost, do me a favor, place the word of God at the center of your life. Start with it, get up with it, and go to bed with it. Make God your compass, your guide. Secondly, allow yourself to speak words of life to you and any dead situation you're in. Speaking life changes everything. As Ezekiel spoke life, the Ruah of God, to the people of God, and they lived. Those two things will bless you as you seek to live this week. 
I pray that you would give me an opportunity on next week to come and get it right. I pray that you would give me an opportunity on next week to share what God has said to me. Tune in next week. It will get better. Your life will be better. And I promise you the God that we serve and love and call to in prayer will be pleased. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Let me bless you before we exit. May the Lord bless and keep. May the face of God shine continually on you and your family. May God bless your children and may God bless your grandchildren and may God bless your great, great grandchildren. May God bless your children's 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 children. May God bless every generation in your life for years to come. I'll look to see you next week. Have a great week and enjoy a Memorial Day experience. Be encouraged.